Hello. Uncle, are you there? Hello, yes. Good morning. Hey, hey how's, it, how's it going? Good. How are you? Good. Good morning, Hi, David. Doug. Hey, David. Good morning. And Clemens. Hello, Doug. Hello. Before everybody jumps on, the SDK meeting is right after this, correct? Uh, yes, but not this week. We're back to uh, every other week thing. So today, after this call, we're going to talk about uh, discovery interop implementation stuff. Okay. All right. And yeah, but the SDK, um, so every other week, and then next week is the KubeCon Europe. Are we going to have it because of that also? Um, that is one of the questions I have on the agenda is Got do it. we want our calls next week? Yep. Got it. Cool. Yep. This booth thing. Do <laughs> <laughs> you know it's pre recorded? Yeah. Hey, Tommy. Yeah. yeah. It's. We are recorded, Clemens. Be careful what you say. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> As if I had ever. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. There, there's no filter. Uh, hey, Vlad. Hey, Doug. Hey. Not the Vlad. Hey, Ginger. Hi, Doug. And Nick. Hi, Doug. Hello. Well, you guys are all eager today. Actually, uh, I'm probably going to get myself in trouble, but what the hell? Um, so you know how Scott's continually nagging me about using the word guys, right? Um, I, I noticed, and I don't know if you, you've noticed this, but in the CNCF Slack, if someone uses the term guys as a bot, that will slap your wrist. And it's, uh, I just think it's kind of amusing. And someone actually went out of the way to create a bot for that thing. It's a new thing because it wasn't there a couple of weeks ago. It is new, yes. <clears throat> I just thought it was amusing. And as far as I could tell, it actually pastes a link to different articles that talk about why it's it's bad to use the term, right? And I don't know how many different articles they point to, but I've noticed at least two different ones they point to. I just, just, these kind of things amuse me. Is, is y'all okay? I think it is. What I, 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 when, when I get in a really pissy mood later this week, I'm sure it'll happen. What, I'm, what I was gonna do is <laughs> put a comment in one of the Slack channels over there saying, you know, guys and gals and see whether it complains. <laughs> Considering I'm the only girl I think that attends this call, it doesn't offend me if you say guys. So, so actually, so I I actually contemplated asking you to be perfectly honest. <laughs> <laughs> but I, given every, all the different comments you've made over the, what the years we've been here, I assumed you were not offended by that kind of stuff. So no, and even on our team calls, I'm the only girl in our company, and our yeah. boss will say guys and then stops and says, oh, I mean, and I'm like, that's worse. Just say <laughs> guys and move on. <laughs> you know? I, know. Uh, I, I gotta be honest with you. I actually thoroughly enjoy it when I'm at a conference or something and there's some woman on stage talking and she uses the term guys constantly, left and right. It just, I just sort of smile. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. enough of the PC stuff. Let's move on. Um, for, for what Flat just posted, oh, uh, in the link, y'all is fine. So. <laughs> So how about you use y'all? See, actually, I would think y'all actually could be offensive to people because are you making fun of Southerners? <laughs> right? I mean, it's definitely a Southern term. Yes, absolutely. So anyway, uh, we could go so many places with this conversation, so maybe we shouldn't. Um, Craig, are you there? <laughs> Craig Rowe. Hi there. Hello. Is this your first time on? I can't remember if we've seen you or not. I might have joined once a couple back, but um, it's been a while. So looking to kind of join and see what's going on in the community. Okay, I'll look later, see if I have your company affiliation. If not, you may want to add that in there. Um, Mark, are you there? You all are too funny. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Christian. <laughs> yep, I'm here. Hello. Uh, good thing this is recorded, right? Christoph, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, continue with the C's. Colin. Hey, Doug. Hello. Uh, Mr. Doug, are you there? The other Doug. Yes, here. 
Hello. Uh, Hamid, are you there? I am here. Excellent. Lance, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Excellent. Remy? Yep. All right. Scott? Done, done, done. Yeah. Slinky, are you there? Hello, hello. Hello, Timur. Howdy. Hello. Did I get everybody? Really? Hello? Oh, Eric. <laughs> there we go. I know. Yeah, Eric, hello. <laughs> do, 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 do. All right. It's three after. Let's get this thing started. 21. All right. <clears throat> community time. Anything from the community if you want to bring up? All right, a couple of housekeeping activities. So for those of you who have forgotten, next week is KubeCon. We are currently signed up for three different activities, at least from the cloud events side of things. Um, we have a booth at 3.30 um, European time and on Thursday at 1.15 European time. Um, looking for volunteers. To, I know it's, it's, both those times are going to be really challenging for West Coast people. Um, let, me just, in, 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 let me just look at uh, for Thursday. Okay. Because but anybody else on the call willing to raise their hand at this point in time? Do booths work in a virtual KubeCon and what would the volunteers have to do? So, I, okay, so Ginger, help me out here because I think you might not know more than me, but I believe it's basically joining a Zoom call, um, potentially having a presentation ready, not necessarily to present the presentation, but to talk to it if, you would, if that would help you in your conversations with people who join the Zoom call to ask questions about cloud events. Is that a fair summary, Ginger, you think? Yes, and they can be whatever you want them to be, frankly. It's 45 minutes for a session and it's open for any of the KubeCon folks. So it's just like having a maintainer's booth, but it's virtual. So if you want to present something or show a demo or something and then take questions or whatever, it's totally up to you guys. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna take the uh, uh, Thursday um, 115 slot. Cool, thank you, Clemens. Uh, if you have no one on Monday and, and being on West Coast, I can do it. But. <laughs> okay, thank you. Just let you guys know, I was planning on joining both of those, so I will, I'll be there as well. Um, okay. But I was hoping to get people just in case. I'm sorry, say it again, Scott. You can do Monday. Excellent. Um, how how do we how do we uh, um, get access to those? I don't know yet, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I I actually asked this yesterday because I thought maybe I missed it. Um, the information I got was they'll be sending out the Zoom link in the coming days is the only thing they said. Now, it starts Monday, so it better be soon. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. I got mine last night. Say it again, Scott? I got my email last night. It's, there's a bunch of links and there's a bunch of uh, rooms on the Cloud Native Slack. Oh, so, so do I, oh. so presumably you registered because I'm not. Well, so hold you don't on a have minute. to be. You don't have to be registered to do the maintainer booth. So Scott, Scott, I remember seeing that note, but is there? I don't think there's a coupon that cloud native. I know there's a coupon serverless group. I mean, sorry, not coupon cloud native. Coupon uh, cloud events. So I think I'm not 100 sure that those channels are, have a one-to-one -one relationship with like working groups and stuff. I could be wrong. That's, that's true. I, I, I don't know. I just saw it last night. And there's a bunch of rooms, uh, a little too much, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. So I those are Slack like channels. They're not Zoom rooms. That is true. They are yeah. Zoom rooms, not Slack channels. So we, either way, we need more information for Zoom. Um, so, so I will assume yeah. that somehow a, a link will show up in my inbox. <laughs> One way or another, I'll, we will make sure that happens, yes. And I'll also paste it into the Slack channel. If right. I hear anything anytime soon, Doug, I'll let you know. Thank you very much, Jinder. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the other thing is, not that anybody next needs to do anything, but we do have the cloud events session itself. Um, I assume, Clemens, that time is good for you to, to answer questions with me, right? Absolutely, it is. Yep. Yes. Oh, boy, you sound excited. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, obviously, anybody else is free to join if you want, um, but it's not required. Like the booths, you know, have to have other people there. Clemens and I will definitely handle that one for sure. Since we are 
I'm sorry, what? It's a great talk, too. It is an excellent talk, yes. We've been one of our better ones. <laughs> okay. Um, any other questions or comments relative to the booth or the session before we move forward? Okay. Um, now, the next question is, do we want to have our calls next week? I, I may be wrong, but I'm pretty sure none of these sessions at KubeCon that we're doing anything uh, with overlap with our regularly scheduled calls. So uh, we can technically have a call next week, or, and in fact, the, and the SDK call. But if for some reason people feel like they don't want to because they're really busy with KubeCon activities um, and other sessions they want to attend, we can skip next week if people really want to. Any opinions? Okay, I, not hearing anybody, I'm gonna to lean towards, let's have the calls anyway. Yes. Any objection? Okay, we shall do so. Thank you, everybody. All right, um, just a reminder, um, before September 13th, we need to decide if we're going to have a maintainer session for cloud events or serverless. If you're interested in speaking, please reach out to me. Um, do not be shy and do not feel like you have to have a ton of experience or anything or even that deep of a knowledge of this stuff, just if you're willing to talk, okay? Definitely looking for other people to speak up besides the regular folks, because we want to make this uh, open to everybody and give everybody an opportunity to talk or present if they want to. All right. Um, okay, just a reminder, we will not have an SDK call after this one this week. However, we will have a discovery interop implementation call right after this one, whenever this one ends, okay? Uh, Timur, anything you want to mention relative to the workflow stuff or anything going on with KubeCon? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, if you guys find any information about the booth stuff, please include me in that as well, because I'm kind of clueless <laughs> completely of what's happening with that. Um, but other than that, yeah, just preparing for KubeCon. Uh, as far as specification goes, we're looking at unstructured or ad hoc processes just to see if they make sense and also some sort of uh, security with JSON web tokens. So if anybody here has any, you know, experience with JWT, uh, I'd highly appreciate some input. Um, and other than just trying to figure out when we can do a next release of the specification. That's all. All right, Uncle Lee, your hands up. Uh, yes, uh, he talked, as I mentioned the last time, the schedule on the CNCF public uh, event calendar uh, shows the, the, the service workflow is still bi-weekly at 5 p.m., uh, which is wrong, I guess. Yeah, thank you for mentioning that, because I did mention it, Timur, we weren't sure what was incorrect about that. So, Timur, you got that? I looked into that. Thank you so much, and and thanks for yeah. I look in, I looked into it. It is biweekly. Uh, we changed that recently from a monthly to a biweekly meeting, so I think that is correct. Uh, the time, however, I'll check on it because when I look in the calendar, looking at Eastern time, it looks correct. But if it's wrong, oh, it's, it's it is biweekly. No. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. If we changed oh. it. We used to be monthly. And after oh. the sandbox inclusion, we thought it would make more sense to end the new repo. We had a lot of stuff going on and we thought Okay, it would okay. I, I, think, I guess it's the serviceworkflow.io, the, the schedule on that page is incorrect. Oh, it shows, it, 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 yeah, because those two are inconsistent. Okay, I'll definitely, I included the CNCF public calendar. I had an old one, so maybe try to see if that update made it, refresh the page, but yeah, instead of having some custom calendar, we added the, the, the CNCF public one, and if that is wrong, I'll check that right away. So okay. thank okay. you so Go much, and, and hope you can join, yeah, thank you. All right. All right, anything else relative to the workflow stuff? All right, moving forward. Okay, before we jump into issues and PRs, is there anything else that I should have added to the agenda but I forgot to add? All right, pagination. So again, I apologize last week for not pushing this up before last week's phone call, um, but I don't think I made any changes since I did update it. Um, I guess the only other thing I wanted to add was, uh, so I, on last week's call, at least I think it was last week's call, we had a very, very brief conversation about things like whether we should use offset versus next versus index and that kind of things. And 
I apologize. I completely forgot that the use of those query parameter names is actually implementation uh, specific. And this, spe and this specification actually doesn't mandate what you use. It's completely up to the server side to decide what query parameters or even the entire shape of the URL to use to represent the next chunk of data. So we don't actually tell people what they do. The only thing we do specify is the link and rel attributes. And let's can show an example of how they appear. So they appear like this, right? So we say you have to have a link and you have to use the link header. And then you have to, you have, to have the URL followed by a rel. And we do specify or point to a document that says um, next and previous and what those things are defined as. But in terms of the actual values in here, that's completely up to the implementation to decide what to do. Right, so you can do whatever you want. Okay, as I said, aside from that, I don't think there have been any changes made since last week. Are there any questions or comments on this? Okay, I'll ask the question then. Is there any objection to approving this as the first draft of this spec? All right, thank you everybody. And please let me know if you have any Open PRs or issues, if any problems uh, with anything. All right, Slinky, would you like to update people on what changes you may have made on this one? And just as a refresher for people, um, we are planning on doing a vote on this one today, unless there are major objections or major issues people find. But this has been out there for a while, and we did talk about this on the SDK call last week. And we did agree that we do want to have something at a global level across all SDKs, but then SDKs themselves could have specific tweaks to the process if they want in their own repo. But we thought it'd be good to have a high level process across all of them that is a little bit consistent. So Slinky, you want to bring us up to date on what you may have changed in here? Well, I think you already said everything. Uh, I just uh, that the, on the initial draft, I, may, I brought some more stricter requirements but then after both the meeting uh, uh, last week and the uh, Slack discussions, I end up making those requirements more soft. Uh, but then I say that in theory, SDKs themselves, the projects themselves can decide to, to develop more stricter requirements. Uh, to, uh, it's not specified how the SDK should develop those stricter requirements. Oh, yeah, I guess it's actually it's wrong. It's actually this whole section. Mm -hmm. I think this is yeah. the newer stuff. Yep. Yeah, the newer stuff is the same. Yeah. I give everybody on the call just a 30 seconds or so just to look this over since that is a little bit new. All right. Any questions for Slinky on this? on either this section or the entire PR. All right, any objection then to approving? Excellent, thank you everybody. And thank you Slinky for your patience on that. Um, okay, I believe, let's skip these two for a sec. Let's drop down to the third one, the JSON streaming proposal. I believe on last week's call, we were asking people to go back to their respective organizations to see if there's any interest in this JSON streaming thing. Did anybody do that? And would anybody like to speak up in terms of what they may have discovered or found out? Silence. Does silence mean everybody's shy or did everybody forget? I'm trying to remember who spoke up. I'm trying to remember who spoke up last week to pick on them, but I can't remember. <laughs> it, it was me, Doug. Yeah, it's Scott. <laughs> I recall it was Scott. <laughs> okay. And you know, my my findings still stand. I, the, the data, big data people are interested in this kind of use case for cloud events because they like the the fact that the payload is decorated, but it needs to come in faster than uh, what HTTP requests can do, and batching isn't quite the right thing. So they would like some sort of streaming solution that's cloud event based. Okay. Anybody else want to chime in? Okay. So I'm hearing at least one person say this is useful. Now, um, Francesca, can you remind me 
on this one, was the discussion about whether the existing specifications cover this or was it just, do we need the, the feature at all? I can't remember how that conversation went. Mm, I don't remember it. I think there was some discussion around uh, uh, what should be the record separator. And oh, yeah. I, and I proposed the um, RSLF, which is uh, an RFC. Uh, the, um, there is another topic which I didn't really explore that, is that um, we might make this compatible one-to-one -one, uh, with server-sent events but server-sent events uses a new line for echo cartoon so maybe this is worth investigating I don't know you okay can. Uh, I mean, for, for me, it's fine, this one. RSLF for me is fine. But if we want to experiment, look for uh, supporting one-to-one -one, uh, server-sent events from W3C, then look at it. Okay. Well, it seems to me that <clears throat> most people probably have not given this a whole lot of thought. So I'm a little bit nervous about trying to do some sort of deeper dive discussion right now. And I'd rather save it for next week so people can go off and you know, review this as a homework assignment. Is that okay with you? For the next two weeks, because next week I'm PTO. So. If, oh. so, so I'm, I'm still... Uh, okay, go ahead, Clemens. I still don't like any of these, of these. <laughs> <laughs> okay. HTTP. So, and so I'm wondering, so there are, there are ways to do this with HTTP2, HTTP um, uh, if, if you want to. Um, and that's like, if you look at how AWS Kinesis uh, is doing its, uh, its delivery of multiple events, then that's something to look at. But that is an HTTP2 feature. But then if we really want to have streaming of, of JSON, then we can, um, then I think the cleaner way is to say, we're going to do a WebSocket binding and uh, um, use uh, WebSocket text frames um, if we really want to have a, um, a, streaming, a streaming model. So either have, either have a feature that explicitly binds to HTTP2, um, and uh, who, I just didn't have my glasses on. Oh, so Scott said HTTP2 is funny. I know where that comes from. Um, no, he said fine, not funny. Um, or uh, we're going to do um, a WebSocket binding, or we're going to do both because HTTP2 um, obviously is incompatible with WebSockets. But but instead of instead of doing hackery around the the, the HTTP delivery model, I would basically drip, just drop down to the respective uh, transports that are optimized for that particular use case because that's why arguably why WebSocket. Uh, text frames exist, and that's also why this um, um, this eventing feature in HTTP two exists, and uh, and use those. I, I have a moderately uh, popular app that that uses WebSockets to stream cloud events out of Kubernetes. Yeah, and and that seems to be a very natural uh, uh, match. Yeah, I, I would love like an actual spec to follow. Right now I'm just pushing a uh, new line delimited uh, JSON blobs. And and there, if you drop down one layer, there like pretty much every WebSocket protocol allows you to go and send frames, like dis distinct frames where, where there are labeled text. And then WebSockets actually does all the, the, limit, the, uh, uh, the delimiting for you where you don't have to go and do any parsing at all. Oh, that's really cool. I, yeah, I'd love to explore that. Because I think that's the cleanest way to do this, where you really want to have a torrent of, of events and you want to, um, like if you wanted to do a stock ticker with, uh, that's a popular example. Um, that's why I'm mentioning that. So you, you connect to a website and um, the website is a stock, uh, it has a stock ticker and now the stock ticker wants to go and give you a stream of events that you can then go and dispatch on your, on your uh, UI. And um, you want that to be, to be cloud events, then um, uh, using WebSockets is exactly the right tech to use. And the text frames are exactly there so that you don't have to do the parsing. So, Francesco, 
since you're the one who brought up this issue, if we went and looked at either HTTP2 or WebSockets um, as the preferred choice for this, would that be satisfactory to you or do you still want an HTTP1 type of solution? Uh, I think so. I think it's, uh, it's fine for me trying to explore HTTP2 or WebSockets. My, right. my concern is just that still not all the web is on HTTP2, but I mean. But everybody supports WebSockets by now. Like the, this, all the browsers do uh, have it and well, the browser has it. Um, and um, uh, most of the web framework support WebSockets. So that's, that's a pretty pervasive thing. HTTP2, I agree, is uh, um, something that is more like an Still internal- Still a pain for, for a lot of our architectures, so. Right. So, so web, WebSockets, WebSockets is, would have been an issue, I would say, until about three years ago. But now it's so pervasive that everybody has mostly given up on all the alternatives, like all the other tricks, long polling, et cetera. And it's just basically going to WebSockets and that works pretty well. Okay. okay. I'm fine with exploring that. Okay. Um, so in terms of next steps on this particular issue, it sounds like we may choose to close it. Are you volunteering, Francesco, to, to open a PR for a WebSocket binding? Um, I think I should look at it together with Scott because Scott already has some pr practical experience on that. So I like the idea of volunteering Scott. Yeah. You no, no, I mean, I, we can do it together. <laughs> <laughs> that, I know what you meant. <laughs> okay. Scott, Scott agreed with you, uh, to, to the, uh, to the chat. So yeah, I don't, I don't have enough work to do. Let's, let's go. Let's do it. I agree. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Uh, it's like the PR. Okay, now the other question is, will this write up right here satisfy the requirement for the multi-content one? Yeah, I think we can close it. To be honest, I, I went through this again a couple of times and yeah, I think we can close it. Okay, so to be clear, we're actually gonna close both of these issues and then wait for another PR to pop up, right? Yeah. Okay. I just want to keep the initial issue open, you know, the yep. one. Okay, is there any objection to heading that direction? And just to be clear, we're talking about closing these two PRs and then waiting for this brand new WebSocket PR or WebSocket binding PR to pop up. I, I think if this happens though, we're gonna wanna talk about um, some sort of options protocol negotiation to understand if an endpoint can upgrade. Well, the great thing is that um, WebSockets already has, has that with you define the, we will define here the cloud event sub protocol. And uh, the, so protocol negotiation of what you want to pick up is already in, in WebSockets. But how do you know to initiate the, the protocol discovery in, in WebSockets? The, the server, so when you do the, the initial, so there's always an initial discovery request. You effectively do a get on the, on the server um, and that will tell you what sub protocols it supports, and then you're going to be offering the upgrade. So there's a whole there's a whole uh, handshake that everybody does. So for instance, if you're using MQP or MQTT with WebSockets, you always start with with a regular HTTP request, and then the server says, "Hey, I can also speak MQP," and then you go and upgrade. Yeah. Do we have to define that, or at least point to that semantics in Cloud Events spec? We basically have to define the sub protocol, um, the cloud event sub protocol, which we will then go and upgrade to. But the sub protocol doesn't have to be so. So some of those sub protocols are uh, layering a binary, an extra binary layer on top of WebSockets, like MQP do and like MQTT do. And our sub protocol here would basically just be text frames. But it would be it would be announcing itself as such, so that you know that you are now using your code path that understands the the the, the cloud the cloud event stuff. Um, I I can um, we can we can work into this together if you want. Yeah, come come join Slinky and I. I like that a third volunteer. I, I wonder if we can uh, uh, maybe I misunderstood, but I wonder if we can take existing web book uh, spec and kind of do the protocol negotiation that's, there. Uh, that's, that, I think that's different. 
Uh, that's different. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, I'm still trying to understand that. Yeah, the webhook spec is really just for delivering events kind of in a push fashion to, to, um, to a target. And this is re really here a, a way to establish a WebSocket and have a particular, a particular way of how the WebSocket is being used, which is we're putting, we're putting um, uh, uh, cloud events into, into the text frames. Mm -hmm. um, and that might actually be bidirectional. Uh, because there's no there's no reason not to constrain to to constrain that. Um, I'll I'll write an email. We still have, uh, but we also do the Slack thing. Um, uh, I'm just trying to. I'm just. I'm having schedule problems. Um, I will try. I will try to make a to to summarize this mechanism um, until next week. Okay. okay. Great. Cool. So, so we can basically just to educate and get us, get us all on the same, on the same uh, level. And then um, uh, we can uh, decide who uh, really picks up the pen. So I'm not going to write a draft spec with the must and the shoulds, but I'm just going to try to summarize in like a page of, of what the, uh, of how that with, works with the sub protocol stuff. Okay, I would love to try an implementation to um, maybe on SDK. Yeah, because just, implement just, just to so check actually, how it works. And so implementations are super easy because we all have existing WebSocket stacks that will relatively make it relatively simple to go and implement all this. Where you, mm -hmm. and nobody has to go and drop down to the to the wire level anymore to go and realize any of those things. Um, but uh, to have a formal spec, we we still need to go and define how that actually happens down at the wire. So I just want to make sure that we have both those things, even though we're, we're all going to use, ultimately we're going to use some existing, pre-existing built clients for this. And Lance cool. just pasted a link in there to, <clears throat> to an RFC that might that's, open this. So that's, a, that's, a, that's an action item for me for next week. All right, cool. All right. Um, any other top, any other discussion points about these two PRs or the yet to come PR? Okay. <clears throat> now Scott has a, pasted into the chat an issue or a link to an issue that I think is kind of related to this, but Scott, before we get to that, just in case we end up rattling on that one, I just want to quickly cover something that I hinted at I was going to do last night, which is Scott opened up a syntactical typo type issue to me. Um, and I wanted to see if we can just get that out of the way, even though it's under the two day limit. I figured it's a, it's, since it's just a typo, we can do that. He noticed that we're missing the, the required protocol field in the sample uh, service output. So I think that's a no brainer right there. And then the other commit is just, he did a ran, he ran length on it. So I assume there was no actual changes in there. There was one other change. One of the other JSON samples had an extra comma that the linter removed. Oh, good. Okay, cool. Thank you. But any objection then to approving this one? And keep in mind, if you have, if you want more time, even though it's a typo, please speak up. But I figured if it since it is just typo, I might be able to get it out of the way. Any object? Any any concerns with approving this one now? Okay. In that case, we can get that out of the way. All right, Scott, you wanted to talk about this one because I do think it's related to what we we're just talking about, right? Yeah, I just, there's a hole in the spec around the callback and the secret. I think it, I, this has been months, but uh, I, don't, I don't understand how to do the out of band get, but also deliver uh, whatever secret there was supposed to be. Clemens, do you have any thoughts on this one? Uh, oh yes. The, the, oh, this. oh. So, so this. Uh, so the get with the browser client. You mean? Yeah. So, there's like a provision that you can authorize the call, but but it doesn't tell you how to also send the the rate limits and the other option headers in that out of band call. So there is a there is a. Um, for if you if you simply have if you're simply building a website and this is not too uncommon 
So you're building a, a, a website with the simplest possible mechanisms. Um, it is possible to go and grab effectively the URL from the log and then simply do a, um, a confirmation request against that endpoint uh, with the browser to sidestep uh, having to go and, and, and do a complete implementation of that handshake. Yeah, yeah I understand that part, but it, it doesn't, doesn't look like there's a, a method to actually give the, the correct rate limits in that out of band case. Oh. Um, ah, no, I get it. Um, bu, 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 bu. Uh, I have to go and take a look at that. I have to think about this. Uh, can yeah. you send it to me? I bumped it. I bumped it into. I bumped into this when I was implementing the webhook support in Cloud Events SDK Go. Uh, so I opened this when I was doing that. Yeah. Can you send it? Um, assign it to me. I'll, I'll take a look at that. And I have to think about this. Um, you say assign it to you. Um, There's a sign. Well, oh, you want me to go that far and actually be official with it? Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, yeah, make, make an official thing. I, um, okay. I, 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 I we, we have such a crazy torrent of notifications on GitHub that um, it's like the pings, and I can't see any of those things. Really? Interesting. Yeah, okay. It's, because it's just too much. I'm enrolled in, I don't know how many. Uh, um, repos that I have nothing to do with, but you will get notifications about assignees differently. It, well, th there is a. I think there's a different panel where I have bugs that I own are sitting in. So, I hope that will help. But I'll I'll take care of this. I have to drop out now. I have to drop now because we have an internal meeting I have to get to. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Bye, Clemens. Thank you. All right. Um... Okay, so we resolve that one, that one. Okay, so Scott, um, actually, let me ask a question. Scott opened up these issues, I think it was just as soon as yesterday. Um, and obviously, there are issues not PR, so there's nothing to necessarily vote on or anything. Um, but were there other topics people wanted to bring up before we get into these? Okay. You want to do it in the discovery call or here? Well, I kind of want to do it here because I think the discovery call is more about implementation details. And I, and I pulled out these two specifically because I thought these were more spec related questions and worthy of a broader discussion, or at least to start the discussion going, if that's okay. Got it. Yep. I'm ready. Okay. Let's talk about this one first. I thought this was the bigger one. Sure. Um, I, I am um, in, in implementing this, in looking at the, what the API does, I think that the types endpoint is sort of out of place. It's because it's a, like I say, it's a projection of the data in the services webhook. It, it strikes me as slightly unrestful because there's two ways to get the, the data through two collections. Uh, and when you do uh, do the aggregation around types for the query. You group services that have similar types, but possibly um, they're completely unrelated. Like if, if, if two producers make a create event, one is a PR and one is a database record. Uh, I, I, like it doesn't make a ton of sense to group those things next to each other. Um, so, so my proposal is to drop the whole endpoint entirely and uh, just maybe add some more filtering capabilities on service endpoint. So for people who don't, <clears throat> haven't looked at it recently, this is what Scott is talking about dropping, right? Yeah, that's right. And the, the oddity is this, the type map and the, the fact that it has the full service inside there uh, is very strange to me. It looks like a, a specific use case convenience method versus uh, something that's uh, required for the implementation. And I think uh, there's nothing that stops anyone from implementing their own version of this, but I, I don't feel like it belongs in the specification. Okay. All right. Anybody having, uh, Christoph, you're off mute. Did you have a question or comment? Uh, sorry, no. Oh, <laughs> okay. Uh, Ron, Ron, Ron. Yep. Uh, Remy, your hands up. Yeah, is uh, I think uh, but maybe we'll discuss even more after. But uh, what um, Scott said, I think is 
I do understand his point of view, but in that case, even the pagination should be out of that uh, spec because that's also kind of uh, uh, selecting some implementation on the side. But it's hard to set the where is the limit between the norm and uh, the implementation by itself. Oh, maybe I don't know if I'm clear on that. I'm not. Scott, did you want to comment on that or? Yeah, it's it's an interesting point, right? Like I I do kind of feel weird about defining this an API in the specification, where we might get away with uh, possibly just defining the payload shape, so that we can serve this data through other means too, not just uh, RESTful APIs, <coughs> Kubernetes, right? Um, so I have a couple issues with the discovery API, to be honest. Well, there's nothing stopping us from separating these specs out, right? Um, having a having an HTTP REST binding for the core spec. It's, I think, I think we just, it's just once, at least in my mind, it's just one document now for convenience, um, but it may split later is, is the way I interpret it. Mm -hmm. I think, I think the overall question you raised, Scott, though, is something we need to discuss is do we want to have more than one way to get back the list of services, right? Because we have the do, 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 do. we have the slash services endpoint and we have the slash types and they return very similar data other than the type one is now grouped by type. And I believe we had this conversation in the past where people thought that it was more friendly, or maybe, maybe the right word, I'm not sure, 100% sure, to have a, have a types thing as the searching mechanism for types. So this felt, whoops, that I think people thought this was more natural than using this type of thing where instead of name, you say type equals something. I seem to recall that conversation. Does anybody remember, am I remembering incorrectly? Because I, I thought we talked about this br briefly before. Like I said, I, I think that's true for s certain implementations and views of this data, but I, it, because the two re return exactly the same data, it, it seems very strange to do this grouping and, okay. and actually spec it out. Anybody have any opinion whether it's strange or not? Anybody disagree with Scott's assertion that we should just get rid of this entire section? And I assume, Scott, if we got rid of this section, we'd need to add another query kind of a thing here that allows you to search based on type? Yeah, I think that's right. We would, we would get services listed uh, and have an additional filter of, of uh, some sort of type, and we can determine some sort of fuzzy matching. Right. Okay. Anybody want to speak up in favor or against that path? Because I wouldn't want to ask Scott to write a proposal or a PR if it's going to get rejected because too many people don't like it on the surface of it anyway. But, so keep in mind, like what I'm proposing is the the actual producers when they're hosting their discovery API, they just have to implement services and services ID. It doesn't stop anything from implementing their own projection view in an aggregator. But that could be a separate component that consumes the the services API. Right, but it, but if they do that, it's an extension. It's not a core part of the spec. So there's zero interoperability guarantees. That's that's right. They right. they have their own custom semantics. Right. Anybody have an opinion? Oh come on! Don't be so quiet. So I don't <laughs> want to. Uh... <laughs> So do you hear me? Doc? Yes, I do. Go ahead. Okay. So don't want to uh, throw the conversation off track, but uh, have we ever considered uh, discovering based on any arbitrary uh, attribute? Because I, I see, you know, services and types being the top level, you know, discovery path. But how about, for example, based on subject or something like that? Yeah, this, that's, that's exactly where my mind went. It, I think defining this types and the pivot table around uh, type value to service mappings 
is cute for one case, but I, I assume that someone's going to want, uh, you know, based on schema or based on mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. service URL or whatever, right? So yep. I don't think we could possibly identify all of the ways that you would like to pivot this data. So my, I was like, well, maybe we shouldn't try. Yeah. I mean, to be honest with you, Scott, I completely agree with this. <laughs> I actually suggested this a while ago and it got shot down, so. <laughs> okay, so uh, Scott, are, are you the one uh, focusing on this one right now? Uh, if you want, I can spend some time with you working on this. Certainly something I'm interested in uh, working on. Oh, sure, yeah, I've, I've, been, I've been trying to do the reference implementation, which we can talk about in the next meeting. Okay, sounds good, thank you. Okay, so based on what I'm hearing in the group or not hearing from the group, it sounds like people are generally okay with heading this direction and see what the PR looks like and potentially removing this, this type stuff, or the types API, I should say. Uh, for me, if I'm vocal, it's just that I'm uh, still uh, trying to figure out where it goes, the whole discovery stuff. So I don't have a strong opinion in either direction. Okay, well, we have time to think about it. We all do. Um, PR is not there yet, so we'll see. <clears throat> okay, um, in that case, the other issue I thought was worthy of a discussion, even though it doesn't seem like it'd be a very big issue, it actually kind of is to me. Scott, you want to talk about this one? Yeah, sure. So the, at the moment, we have services uh, types, uh, which is an array of, of these type objects, and internally, the type object claims its name by calling itself type, which in most modern APIs, when you get down to the, the actual object that talks about itself, it, it says like, hey, I'm, my name is this, not my type is this. So I think that type that is highlighted there should actually be called name. So it's name and description, and that refers to the type object of the cloud event type. And I added a comment on the issue. I think, I think the reason we went this direction was because um, this is the way it would appear inside the cloud event attributes. The same way all these would appear, I believe this way, at least the, the, the ones that do line up with cloud events, like mm -hmm. data schema and so like that. Interesting enough, I guess, that, yeah, these, these two anyway, right? Um, so the question there and to me is, uh, Abstractly, I think I agree with you, Scott. Name makes a lot of sense. It's just from the consistency perspective, would people prefer to see type here and then type is what appears inside the cloud event? That's the only thing that, would, that was running through my mind. But I'd like to hear what other people think. I'm gonna pick on people. <laughs> Eric, I'm gonna pick on you. Do you have any comment on this one or thought on this one? Uh, not a good one. I thought that uh, the consistency argument held a little weight. I liked it. Um, my kid also was up and down all night and screaming at us to come. So I'm not totally here. <laughs> That's a good excuse. I like that. Okay. Um, anybody else want to chime in? Lance, as an, as an SDK gut person, you may uh, have some thoughts on this one. I'm not sure I have any thoughts that I'm willing to share at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Well, I picked on two people. That's, that's my quota for the day. Um, anyway, think about it. Obviously, it's not a huge PR, um, but it is. I, th I do think it's kind of an important one. Because uh, it it does kind of impact the, the, the UX side of things slightly. I mean, potentially good, potentially bad, depending on your point of view. It I mean the the name of the cloud event attribute, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about that, but it also doesn't apply to most of these attributes. Like description, schema type, schema content, and extensions don't apply. And description. True. So what we're really talking about is type, data content type, and data schema matchup but the yep. rest of them are oddballs, so. Yep. yep, totally true. And then in up up above, service has a name. Should that be service? 
That's a good question. Does this does this appear in the cloud event? No. Uh, I don't think it does, does it? No. Yeah. And do we want do we want to have a unique name for types and keep type? So you can type could be create, but this the name of it could be a database injection row create event. Say that again one more time. You lost me. I don't know why you lost me, but you did. <laughs> well, so look, your actual implementation could keep type very small. It could have description, which is very long, but maybe there's this like medium thing of uh, a little bit more context around what what this thing is creating. So it could be like a database row create for the name, but the type is just create. Where would you see that field showing up or is it strictly just for informational purposes when they're looking at the discovery stuff? It's just for discovery. It, it, it serves a similar purpose than to, to name. I, I don't know, I'm just spitballing. Yeah. Something to think about, I don't know. Okay, well anyway, everybody please, please think about this one. Um, um, I do think we should probably have a discussion next week. Um, I don't know, Scott, if you want, whether you want to wait or create a PR or not, but either way, people, please think about it. Any other comments on this one before we move forward? Okay, um, I think that's it for the normal agenda. Um, before we jump over to the discovery interop or implementation call, are there any other topics people would like to bring up? Okay, and let's just do the last <clears throat> attendee list thing and then we'll let everybody go. Um, Nirmal, are you still there? I don't, I don't see that, unfortunately. What about Josh, you there? Yeah. Josh, hey there. <clears throat> yeah, gotcha. I'm here, but right. I, you know, um, honestly, there's just been, there's been a lot of developments in the service, serverless world this week and I was just dialing in to see whether or not y'all were talking about them. I That's fine. We like we like lurkers. Okay. That's okay. Yeah, <laughs> I don't have I don't have opinions on these changes. No, 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 I wasn't asking about that. I just want to get you on the attendee list, and you just have to say oh, okay. yes, I'm here. That's it. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, Manuel. Yes, I'm here. All right, and Grant, you're there, right? Yeah, actually, I got to use the chat. Yes, I'm you're, here. You're, you're good. Yes. All right, Nirmal. I don't see him. Anybody else I missed for the attendee list? All right. In that case, everybody else is free to go. Anybody sticking on? We're, we'll start the. Uh, discovery implementation call in about a minute or so. Thank you, everybody. All right, just a couple more seconds. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, so trying to think about what we wanna talk about. Scott, let me pick on you, since you're the latest entry into the uh, implementation side of things. Is there anything from your perspective that you'd like to bring up aside from the issues that you opened? Or I guess if you want to talk about any of those issues, we can talk about those too. I, no, I think I, my main focus is around simplification of the, the service that is trying to host this data. Right. Was there anything in the spec that you've come across so far that just, I, I, I know you, you noticed lots of things in there, or a couple of things in there anyway. They all don't, they seem relatively minor so far, right? I didn't, you didn't raise some huge objection to the spec in general. Is that a good sign or do you think you just haven't gone far enough along yet to know whether this is a piece of crap and we need to revisit you know, the core design? No, I don't, I don't think there's anything majorly wrong with it. The one big question I do have is around um, the, the actual REST interface. And I like the fact that we're trying to define what the payload means. Um, I, I want to make sure that there's uh, room enough to implement this thing as a like a CRD based Kubernetes thing. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, 
I'd like to talk more about that at some point, but let's get to the other stuff first. So in terms of moving forward here, do, does, has anybody have given any thought to um, how we might do some sort of interop testing or something along those lines? Uh, well, we could, we could implement the aggregation part and then chain a couple of these things together. Interesting. How do you see that playing out from a client perspective? Is it is it then each each person would like maybe write their own client and talk to the different options in terms of endpoints? Like they talk to the base one and then talk to the aggregate one and make sure they get the same information type stuff. Had you given each link in the chain is a client to the next the the previous thing? Oh, that's an interesting way to think of it. Uh, everyone's front end is someone else's back end, as the phrase goes. <laughs> trying to figure out if you make it completely circular. Uh, Oof. I don't, do that. <laughs> I don't uh, I say that. Uh, it would be fine. It would. Uh, I'm wondering if you get into like a, you'd have to, it'd be kind of interesting if you actually did that, right? Where maybe each one only added like a couple of things to the picture. And after a while, would they all end up having the exact same set of data because they all sort of synchronize with each other. Yeah, the, I think the chain would all uh, harmonize. Yeah, that'd be, that would actually be kind of a cool little exercise. And then <laughs> have a client hit every single guy, you know, or every single uh, point in the ring and make sure they all return the same data. But everybody yeah. starts out with different data. That'd be sure. kind of cool. <laughs> I, the code that I wrote is, is a very super basic um, implementation. Just reading the spec and writing some Go code. It's not a ton of lines of code. Um, and not totally not intended to be like a library that you host some stuff out. I was just reading the spec, trying to make sure it makes sense to me. Right. There's, it's not dynamic data and it doesn't do fetching and lookup, but it could. Right. Well, I, I, I don't know whether it's goofy or not, but I actually really like this idea of this circular thing and, and seeing whether they all sort of get into eventual con a, a consistency state across all of them, right? Because yes. that would test things like the ID stuff. And then if we introduce the notion of, well, one of them is going to update their list. Um, and if you get everybody say 30 seconds or so, you know, does that, does that change get propagated to everybody accordingly? And then, you know, delete something. Does everybody pick that up properly? Uh, the, was it a PR or an issue around um, some, some discovery changes for watch? I don't think we actually have anything. I, I think you may have mentioned a watch type of API, but I don't think I've actually seen an issue or PR. Yeah, I think there is. Let me, let me check. Okay. But I think that, I think that's actually a really cool idea. Well, I'm kind of full of cool ideas. You are. It's awesome. <laughs> Anybody else want to chime in? And Grant, just to pick on you for a sec, um, in case you joined hoping to do the SDK call, we're not having one this week. It, it would be, it's going to be next week in case you join for that. Okay. Um, not not right. that you have to leave. You're, you're welcome to stay. Just, <laughs> I, just, I just realized that you may be here for that call. No, discovery is interesting. Okay, cool. Okay. Well, uh, Scott's looking for that. Oh, oh, did, did you find what, it? What Clemens... Uh, proposed is that the services emit cloud events based on changes, which could, could work. That's a push model. I was looking for more of like an active watch model, but it's interesting. That would, that would definitely do what we're trying to do. Yeah. Well, this, I think what's neat is this circular thing could help reinforce the notion of whether we need one or the other or, or, or both type of thing. Because as part of the scenario, if we describe, if we define it as one of the one of the guys in the chain updates something. How does everybody else find out about it? Right. We need to answer that question, and this would be a good way to force it or force that discussion. I like it. Now, Scott, since you volunteered for some stuff earlier today, unless someone else wants to chime in here, I wouldn't mind taking a first step writing up a very rough outline of what this scenario doc would look like. Sure. Okay. Anybody else want to? 
volunteer. I don't mind handing it off to somebody else, but I also don't mind doing it myself. I actually have a random question, Doug. Um, yep. Is there um, previous details on the discovery spec? Say that one more time. So, so, so this segment that we're actually talking about is I'm looking at the um, uh, the repo right now. Um, mm -hmm. th there was a lot of content. So I was wondering if there was a previous discussion that actually happened last week that I missed. A discussion oh, I, around. I, I found it. Oh, here we are. Yeah, there, there's, there's, the, there's a whole spec. So yeah. okay, no, I, I'm actually in the wrong location. Never mind. I, oh, okay. I was looking at um, a different segment of this. Cool. Thank you. Uh -huh. Yep. Okay. I haven't um, implemented the pagination PR either because that was yeah. just accepted today. Yeah, I haven't done that, but I think that'd be a good thing to test too. Actually, make, make a note of that. So test things like update, deletes, oops, pagination. And conflicts. Uh, elaborate a little what you mean by conflicts. Well, so uh, let's say that you have that chain situation and uh, the source of truth updates their, um, their event, but then they're informed by the, the, uh, their other ring member that uh, the source of truth that they think is true uh, is now coming in as stale data. So like, do, maybe we need like a resource version on those things like or a, a version number to, to understand what, like which one should win if it if there is a conflict in the service that you can define and one is stale data and one is uh, more fresh. I'm trying to understand how that would happen. So in, in your mind, do you see one uh, node in this chain having multiple inputs or just a single input? So it's just a single link list or circular link list? I, well, in the simple case, there's just a circle and there's three entities. Right. If, so A, B, and C. If A is the source of truth for the A event, mm -hmm. and it, but it's also watching for changes on C, A changes the A event, and C provides the previous version of A's A event to oh. A. Now A's job is to go and and merge that data into its data set. So how does it, how? Yeah, it's gonna be interesting. And then, it, you know, I don't know, it, maybe there's, if you have more of a tree architecture where A informs B informs C and A also informs C and B is out of date with A's events. C should probably listen to A as the source of truth, not uh, B. Yeah, that's this almost sounds like it's getting to the whole category of, uh, I don't want to say a new spec, but it, it definitely is a, a section or a spec that talks about how to do this aggregation, right? Yeah. Well, it, yeah. it could be as simple as a resource version or, or a version number, right? Like, or an updated event, uh, maybe the, the last update time or something like that, right? Like, yeah. I think. Version numbers are usually simpler because it's easier to implement than time comparison. Yeah. The resource version thingy. Yep. Okay. Something to add to the mix. Yep. Okay. Cool. Okay. I like this a lot. I like this. This actually sounds like a really cool scenario. Um, <clears throat> okay. Anything else people want to bring up? either about the interrupt scenario or about next steps that we should take relative to our, our respective implementations. How many implementations are we working with here? I know of at least three, yours, mine, and Remy's. Oh, cool. Yep. It, Where's your own um, Linky? <laughs> I'm kind of stalled uh, because um, I really see two different kind of implementation and I, like, um, I'll probably work less with Claude even than you guys uh, because I want to use it, but uh, it's clearly not uh, close to production in our company. Um, but when I when I did the discovery, my thinking was like, if I created like uh, microservices, I want to be able to host a small discovery service. So basically, then people can know what that microservice exposed as uh, Cloud events and things like that. Um, I didn't took like 
the example of like the big one, which is basically the aggregator, where it can be my enterprise discovery system that will aggregate all my microservices. But in that example, as a developer, my thought was like, when I develop my microservice, I just want to expose that. And whenever I redeploy, when I do continuous deployment, it's gonna evolve and add the new events automatically. But when I do that, my issue is like, first, uh, it's gonna be hard to send cloud events because it's based on the deployment. So it's, it's not like uh, I'm basically changing the service. So I don't really see how I will emit the cloud event because then it will be relying on the CI parts that does the CD, I guess. Or maybe I'm wrong, uh, but like I have issues, like philosophical issue, I suppose, and uh, where well, I'm not sure I understand completely what we try to achieve. So I'm kind of stuck there for now. Uh, so in in my exact use case, um, I work on k-native eventing. We have the concept of a broker, which you could you could think of as a general purpose, uh, like Kafka or Nats broker. The, um, it'd be interesting to be able to ask that, that broker all of the microservices that are sending it events. And so the, the, you know, there's some magic under the hood there to, to make sure that the microservices all serve up a discovery endpoint, but a consumer of events off the, that broker don't want to go and ask every microservice yeah, what, uh, exactly. what events they make. Right? Yeah, and so in your scenario, for now I did the discovery service like of the microservices, but I didn't do the aggregator on the I didn't do the, the aggregator on the on the broker part, which is most valuable for the the client, I do agree. I don't think the aggregator is gonna be a very common implementation. I think it's only for these very special broker like things that would like to host a superset. Like maybe they don't emit events themselves at all, but they do facilitate the uh, aggregation of several microservices into a single consumer. Yeah, and in my case is like, um, so I would like to have the microservice that expose like a really basic uh, endpoint of discovery, which basically the less logic I have, the better it is. And then I was seeing like maybe doing a small open source product that, uh, but maybe your broker make, can make it and it's even better for me. Um, that will be like our enterprise way of discovering it. So then you're like, it's our single point. That's where you go. And when you create new microservice, they kind of register to that one. Uh, I think we still need to figure out how your microservices tell upstream that uh, they've, they've updated their catalogs. Yeah, you're right. But like one of the things, like by sending cloud events, the issue is really like, maybe I'm, not having the full picture, but if I change my pod and I create like, basically I update my versions, then I have new events. But when I do that, like how the new pod know what was the previous pod? It's kind of uh, to, to know what kind of cloud events you need to send. To send. Uh, that's where I'm still confused. Um, I maybe do not spend enough time uh, implementing or playing with it or not to have a less confused ID. So Lance, your hand is up. Did you want to chime in in this conversation or was it something different? Um, <clears throat> well, a, a little of both. Um, Remy, um, the, the discovery spec that you've implemented, that's the PR in the JavaScript SDK? Is that correct? Yeah, correct. Yeah. Have you iterated on that at all? Is it, or is that the, the, the point of truth for that? Uh, I didn't iterate more while we were changing some spec. Like I wanted to, to get better understanding. Yeah. Uh, okay. I don't think it will take that much time because like the whole logic is already there. So it's not like crazy. I had to implement the UID stuff. Cause like, so same thing, the UID I talked with Doug in the past, like it was a bit uh, disturbing me because as it's kind of statically linked into your code, uh, generating the UUID was kind of um, meaningless in that situation. So what we agreed is like to create a UID based on the name, which is a specific case, but um, 
because again, it makes sense when you have like a big discovery service as a standalone product, but if you embedded it into service, then you don't want to have state, you don't want to have all those. And even pagination is kind of, uh, an, I would say a bit annoying to do. It's not impossible, but uh, it's like not the same uh, ID, I think. But I'm happy to revisit if you need uh, some uh, updates. Uh, and so it's, I don't think no, it's I, I was much. just curious. But, but I'm also, and this is maybe just, you know, unfamiliarity with it on my part, but what the question that, that kept coming to mind for me was, well, if these discovery services are emitting events, where, where do they, these events get emitted to? And Scott, you mentioned the Knative eventing broker. That makes a lot of sense, but obviously that's not going to come along with just some implementation of the discovery spec. So is there like, I guess, I don't know, to me, there's kind of a gap, like it's emitting events to what is that part of any anything that needs to be specified you would probably have some sort of hook registration process in the microservice it says like hey i would like to be informed of events please send events to me and likely that is going to be a fan out and, and that hook reg that registration service is and i'm sorry i you know haven't spent enough time with the spec to be to know um is that part of the spec or is that something that's just left open to the reader? I assume it would have to be part of the spec, similar to how the subscription API is. In fact, like you could probably apply the subscription API to the, the control plane events for the, the discovery API. Sorry, I was distracted. <laughs> Somebody made me. Are, are we done with, those, with that conversation? Doug, get in the game, man. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, yeah, whenever I host this phone call, it's like that's when people decide to start talking to me. And it's like for them, this whole hour, hour and a half, however long it is, it's like my backlog of Slack messages just, just gets huge. So I apologize. Yeah, Any no, other? My, my, my questions were just sort of a, a little basic background information, I guess. Okay. Okay. Um, actually, what's interesting is Remy, your your comment earlier about your preferred implementation choice of you know just a single discovery endpoint for one or more services that's back there, not necessarily part of this whole aggregation thing. I actually think that would actually be an interesting twist to the scenario that I was going to write up because we could have obviously a circular list of aggregators, but there also could be branches, I guess might be the right word, of just one-offs who aren't necessarily participating in the aggregation, but their inputs into the circular aggregation, right? And see how that plays into it. It shouldn't matter, but it'd be interesting to make sure it doesn't impact anything. Yeah, the topology is usually called the ring and spoke. There you go, thank you. Okay, anything else you guys wanna bring up on this call at all? I think I have a really cool direction laid out. And I like it, it and it's been, it can be a nice forcing function for testing some of these things. I think Lance has a good point around like how, how does that, if, if the thing's gonna raise events, like what does that really mean? And um, one option could be that we, we implement the HTTP watch API and it's like, if, if someone is interested in uh, receiving the events, they, the, the, the consumer of those events initiates the request and it's basically a hang and get. And uh, when an event gets raised, that gets distributed to all the clients that are connected. So uh, push versus pull. Was there a question in there or are you just explaining the difference between push versus pull? No, I'm I, I'm I'm thinking about the implement, implement implications of adding um, these these events to the discovery API for changes. Oh, okay. I think we need to solve both the like, how do you know the consumers of the the changes to the discovery API, and and then also this thing we've picked up around some sort of like resource version or version of the service that the discovery API holds. 
Yeah. So let me ask you a slightly different question, although it's related. Your watch API, do you see that being a completely separate API? I mean, I, I know you're, you, in your mind, you're thinking of the, the Kube watch thing. So I know that's where your head is at, but would it make sense to set up that watching mechanism via the subscription API spec that we have? So you think of it more as a subscription as opposed to a watch, and it just happens to be a pull style. Uh, yeah, I, I, I kind of implied that we could leverage the subscription API to do this because, right, like the discovery API in microservice becomes another um, subscription. Right. Subscriber, subscribee. <laughs> Yeah, because that's another cool aspect of this, right? You get we we get we then get to bring in this whole subscription API spec into the mix, which would be nice. So, uh, Remy, is your hand up, new or old? Uh, it was new. Um, I was just thinking. Um, I don't know if it exists. Do do we already have like a Kubernetes system out where we could all push uh, like a basic functional? Uh, system like the discovery the subscription to understand the whole cinematics maybe i'm completely off as it exists <laughs> and uh, i'm asking stupid stuff but uh, it's just for me it's the same i really need to make it real and uh, i didn't read enough of the subscription api so I, it's also lack of knowledge on my side but like i like to understand the full cinematic of a complete scenario where like i have like Either I'm a microservice developer and I push a new service inside that cube and basically it magically appears in the discovery and starts sending. And as an external developer, a scenario where I'm just like using the discovery service, find new stuff and just have to register to those new stuff and make it all work. Uh, I suppose maybe it exists in your company and it's just me lagging. But uh, that's... For me, I, I like to see things working completely. And for now, when I developed it, the discovery service, I was doing it abstractly, like without really using it. So I don't know if such a cube that we could share all together and work, uh, exist or not. Yeah, I, I don't know of one. Anybody on the call know of one? Yeah, sorry, I don't, I don't think anybody does. But he, he's okay, what's, what's the one? No, one what? I guess like. I, go ahead, Remy. Sorry. No, go, go ahead, Remy. Uh, like um, basically one place where maybe a Kubernetes, because I think Kubernetes might be easier, where we can all deploy uh, our discovery service and like having a full cloud events environment working, meaning the subscription API, the kind of the broker, so either the Kafka or whatever, but like a full small working cloud events to be able to test and uh, play with it more. Uh, because for me, it's still abstract because we don't use it in our, our company. You might have this in your company, but I don't. I, I mean, th this should work Kubernetes or not. I think it's yeah, exactly. The, make sure that, it doesn't require Kubernetes, but is possible. Yeah, it's just to all share, like basically to all be able to deploy uh, small pods all together, like a different company, but just to see the interoper interoperability. Sorry, that was my thought. So Kubernetes is just a technical uh, detail. Not yeah, I mean, I'm going to toot the Knative horn. It's, it's basically what we're doing. So you stand up Knative eventing and you see uh, cloud events only. Okay, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I was just going to say that basic, basically that um, it, it might be useful to have some instructions in order to set all this stuff up using, um, I think um, Carlos Santana has a, a kind cluster set of instructions in, that gets Knative serving running. Can you, adding eventing to that is just a few CRDs. Um, and then it, I don't know, I mean, it might be useful to have some images and uh, a couple of YAML files so that we, you know, once this, these things come, you know, into a little bit more concrete form so that we could 
easily just stand something up locally and play with it on a kind cluster or something like that? Just a thought. I, mean, yeah. I think it's a good idea. It just feels a little premature since we don't really have running code yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. <laughs> yeah but that, that will allow us to basically then for the interoperability test, we can just all push uh, our stuff in it and uh, make it work. Yeah. Yeah. I can I can probably spend some time looking at it like I was looking at Kubernetes on some stuff. Yeah. But then, okay. and, and then you just open it to all the members from this group so they can push to the same cluster and we can play like a playground to yep. test. Okay. Okay. Thank all you. right. Anything else anybody want to bring up? Um, this is the, <clears throat> excuse me, this is the first time I've attended this particular call. Um, and I only did it because <laughs> you said it was happening at the end of the, the, um, the meeting before. And um, I didn't know about it. Um, is, how often does it happen? Is it, it doesn't appear to be on the calendar. But this is the very first sick call. Okay. Well, that's why I haven't <laughs> it, it attended before. <laughs> that's right. And we, we just decided to do it last week um, on the, on the cloud events call. So <laughs> you, you didn't miss anything. Pay, paying more attention last week. There you go. <laughs> Yeah, um, actually, that's something we didn't talk about. <clears throat> Should we assume that we're going to do this on a regular basis, like maybe do it every other week and, you know, one week SDK, other week uh, discovery or interop testing, or is every other week too far apart? I suspect if we did it every week, we may not get as much changes done on a weekly basis to warrant a call, but... Like the every other week interop, in, interop call. That's interesting. Yeah. Should you plan on that? My little plus one. Okay. Plus one, two. I like that idea. Okay. Alternate. Oh my gosh. I mean, it, I, I see this as one big deficit of the, the cloud events spec community is that there isn't a ton of interop development that's happening. You know, comparing this uh, participant list to the cloud events call participant list, right? Like, there's a lot of uh, opinions on the spec, but not a lot of uh, fingers typing the implementations. Yeah, that is a good point. I, I know that there are lots of implementations out. Well, I don't know about lots, but I know there are there are implementations out there because when I've gone to talk to customers about other subjects and cloud events just happens to come up, um, I hear about them implementing stuff, you know, and they're excited by it. So they are doing stuff with it. Um, I just get the feeling that it's more just proprietary homegrown stuff and then, you know, they, they, they just do whatever they need to do to get their job done and they're not really interested in interop beyond what the spec says. Yeah, Dapper rolled their own implementation. Of cloud events? Of cloud events, yeah. Cool. Yeah. I mean, you think about it, it's not exactly a whole lot of code, right? <laughs> so I'm not that surprised. There's a lot of corner cases that they probably don't have uh, correct. Maybe, yeah. All right. Anything else anybody want to bring up? All right. In that case, I believe we are done. Hey, Doug, do we have a place that points to the, the code? Like, is everyone's implementations open source? Mine is not yet. I will open source it at some point when it's not embarrassing, oh. but I, not yet. Uh, <laughs> what, what language are you using? I'm using Go. Dog. Why not? <clears throat> it's the language of choice for me these days. Yeah. No one. Remy, yours is what? JavaScript? Uh, TypeScript. Yeah. TypeScript. Okay. It's. Uh, I just posted a link to the PR. It's in the SDK repo. Um, the, which opens another question about whether that's the right place for it to be, but. For me, it's really, if it's like the microservice discovery part, inside the SDK was not, for me, the wrong place. If it's the full uh, aggregator service with like way more feature, then it should definitely be uh, another repo. So I was thinking almost that of doing it twice. One smaller, like uh, that you can just pack with your service and like a bigger one that is almost a standalone product, but uh, Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, I, I'm still open. <laughs> Again, like I, I don't claim to understand the full scope of what I'm doing, so, which is a bit uncomfortable. But, uh, 
Yeah, we can always move stuff later. Not, nothing set in stone, right? We can always create, you know, brand new SDK or implementation type of repos as, as necessary. Yep. Yeah, I guess um, yeah, that brings up a good question. So is like uh, the discovery part, is that, is that part of the SDK spec? I don't think it's part of any SDK. Well, do we even have an SDK spec? I don't think we do, do we? Um, we have the SDK markdown doc in this. Oh, spec. no. No, I don't, no, not, not as of right now. Okay. Uh, the, 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 there isn't any real project yet, so. Yes, like if this, if the discovery part would bring any dependencies into the SDK, that probably wouldn't be ideal for for people that don't use discovery. Yeah, I do agree, Grant. That's why I really like strip it to no dependency at all. Even the express implementation is done without express dependency. Okay. Mm -hmm. There's yeah. two perspectives there. There's the, the hosting part and there's the consuming the API part. Yeah, you're right. I didn't do the consuming API part yet, but that one should probably be in the SDK then, no. Okay, anything else? All right, in that case, I believe we are done. Thank you, everybody, for joining. I'll talk again next week. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.